Welcome to episode 16 of the Untamed Podcast. I'm your host, Lou Urich, certified eating psychology coach, body image mentor, and life coach on a mission to wake, shake, and fangirl women everywhere to be who they are, unashamed and absolutely untamed. This podcast is for anyone who's ready to find freedom, break rules, shed labels, think outside of the box, and live beyond limits. No matter who you are or how you identify, you are welcome here. So join me as I air and share my conversations with inspiring friends who are challenging stereotypes, leading the charge, and changing the world. For more information on today's guest and the subjects we discuss in the show, check out the show notes at untamedpodcast.com. Hi, Untamed listeners. Welcome back to another episode. This episode of Untamed is with guest Melissa Toller, who is a body justice advocate. She does similar work to the work that I do in the world, but she does it in such a beautiful, powerful way. She talks about not just the injustices of the beauty ideal in terms of weight and body size, but also in terms of race and gender identification and age and ability and so many other things that are a part of true body positivity, that are a part of the true roots of where that term and where that movement came from. So we're going to have a great engaging conversation that I'm very excited to share with you in just a moment. But before that, a few announcements. Those of you who have been around for a while know that my first announcement always is thank you. It is gratitude to those of you who are reaching out, connecting, touching base with me in one way or another to share your thoughts, opinions, encouragements, and support of the Untamed podcast. I love hearing from listeners. So please don't be a stranger. You can reach out to me on social media. I'm on Instagram at louitz.com, Twitter at louitz, Facebook, Lou Urich, and you can find all of those social media accounts as well as a way to connect with me via email by going to untamedpodcast.com. In the top right corner, there will be a connect link. And if you click connect, you can leave me a note there. If you scroll down to the very bottom of the page, you're going to find ways to get in touch with me through my social media accounts. So come on over, say hi. I would love to get to know you and I would love to hear about the things that you're liking or the things that you're desiring in the Untamed podcast. If you want to connect even further or build community with Untamed, one of the great ways to do that is through the Untamed Facebook group, which you can find at untamedpodcast.com, or joining the newsletter, which you can do there also. So untamedpodcast.com is basically the hub where you not only find show notes of this current and past episodes, but also where you'll find ways to connect with me and the Untamed community in a way that feels right to you. There's so many different options, and I hope that you pick the one that feels best. Finally, as I've announced for the last several episodes, I am still running an incentive for those of you who are sharing, rating, and reviewing the podcast. It's super important to me that the word gets out about these brilliant guests, about the messages and the topics that they're speaking on. I want more and more people to connect with the Untamed community and get to know the show, get to know the podcast and the people who are on it and the people who make it what it is, which is you and me and all of the amazing guests that we have. So a great way for us to connect more people to the show, to get these awesome voices, these amazing women into the ears and, you know, like into the radar, into the world of other people is through sharing and through rating and reviewing. So the incentive for that right now is that for those of you who share, who rate and review, I will be putting you all in a drawing to win a free 30-minute coaching session with me. I have some perks here, right? Because yes, it's an incentive for you to take the time and the energy to go and rate and review a podcast, which I know from experience isn't as easy as it looks. I mean, technically, it's relatively easy, but to take the time out to remember with all the other things we have going on in life, to give a shout out, to share, or to rate and review a podcast is difficult. It takes time and energy, which is often scarce for many of us. And so, yes, it's an incentive for you, but also it's pretty cool for me. It's a great perk to spend 30 minutes speaking with one of you and helping you walk through any area of life that you'd like to. We can do life coaching, body image coaching, disordered eating or eating psychology coaching. We can talk about, you know, where you're going from here in your career or in your relationships. Whatever it is that you'd like to talk about, I am here for you. 
and I will be offering a free 30-minute coaching session to somebody, one of the raters, reviewers, or sharers. You can enter as often as you want. Every share, every rating, every review that you do will give you an entry into the drawing. So I'm so looking forward to meeting one of you in this capacity in just about another month. I appreciate the shares, the ratings, and reviews that have already happened, and thank you to those of you who are planning to do it in the future. Now, on to the good part of the show, the interview, my conversation with Melissa Toller. She has tons of great things to share with all of you, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Melissa Toller is a speaker, writer, and educator. Her goal is to help women make the connection between our culture's oppressive beauty standards and our personal struggles with self-acceptance. She helps women unlearn the toxic messages and behaviors from lifelong dieting so that they can live free from obsession and self-loathing. Having a 25-year history with dieting herself, she knows personally what it means to be stuck in the diet binge cycle. Melissa gave up the weight loss quest years ago, and it was one of the best decisions she's ever made. Now she's working in several capacities to help others do the same. Maybe her words and her wisdom will help you through this interview. Hi, Melissa, and welcome to the Untamed Podcast. Hey, Lou. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to have you here and excited to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my life and the work I do in the world and is also the work that you do in the world. I did introduce you a little bit at the beginning of the episode, but I'd love for you to share who you are and what you do with the listeners. Yes. So thank you so much for having me here today. So I am Melissa Toller, and I am um, a speaker and a writer and an educator. And all of my work is focused on issues around diet culture and fat phobia. Um, And I'm starting to explore the intersections of those things with race and gender and class. And, you know, I'm not the first person to do this work. It's just something that I need to do to explore, to unlearn some things for myself. And so that's a big focus in my work is helping other people unlearn a lot of the toxic and harmful messages that have been sold and told to us as truth for so long. So, you know, my process is to unlearn for myself and then help others do the same. Yeah, that's a great process. I like that idea of deconstruction and deconstructing what we've been told, what we've been inundated with, and then reconstructing and doing that. I think you do it so well in a very transparent, upfront, public sort of way that other people can easily get on board and just identify with you and the process that you're going through, which I know one of the ways that you process so beautifully is your writing. But I think you do a great job of, of learning and unlearning right there for all to see and participate in. Mm, thank you. I think that's like one of the, you know, writing has helped me tremendously to just process and peel away tons of messages that, you know, have been stuck in my head forever and that have guided my behavior. And I realized over time through my writing that other people were using my words to unlearn and relearn themselves. So yeah, that's become a big part of what I do now. Yeah, I so appreciate it. I love that idea of the community that can be built around just one person showing up and doing their work in a way that might not always be, might not always look organized or pretty <laughs> or all put together or as though, you know, you're already an expert and you have it all figured out. But instead, as if you are someone, which you are, right? You're just a, a fellow human being figuring all of this out together in the culture and the society that we're in and taking a second look and holding it up to the light and going, maybe there's a different way to look at this than what I've always been taught. And doing it in a place and space where other people can join in and witness what you're doing and participate. Absolutely. I, you know, I make it, I make a point to not come across as an expert or someone who has all the answers. Because number one, I, I don't think that's just possible. And number two, you know, it just puts a lot of pressure on people to have the answer or always be right. And I don't want that. I don't think there is one right way of thinking around this or one right way of being. I think the most important thing in my experience is is the process of discovering. And I try to put all of my emphasis on that and for people to to have their own discovery process. For some people it may be writing and it may not be. But one thing I I try try to do, especially when I talk about diet culture, is to 
encourage people to figure out their own way because diet culture tells us there's only one way or very few ways to do this one thing. You know what I'm saying? So I try to to let people know, to remind people that they have autonomy and they can discover what's right for them. Yeah. And that we're living, breathing, evolving organisms too. I know that I want to get into this a little bit because you are now what you would say is a body justice advocate. And you work on sharing about body liberation and breaking down some of the oppressions that happen within the diet culture, the wellness community, and things like that. But you weren't always at that place, right? At one time, you were selling diet culture. And I think this is so important for the listeners to hear. And it it goes off of what you just spoke about, which is that we are always on this process of learning. And no one has to appear an expert that we're just processing together and doing the best we can with what we know and then continually learning more and doing more then with with what we learn. And I've seen that in what I know of your history, but I love if you would share a little bit with the listeners about this, because I think sometimes when people come to Body Positive, which we'll get into a conversation about Body Positive soon too, but when they come to anti-diet, Body Positive, Fat Positive, Body Liberation sort of groups, or when they happen upon a podcast episode like this, or a blog post like yours, there sometimes can be this level of guilt or like, oh gosh, I've had it all wrong and shame on me. So here we've been shamed in diet culture and fitness culture. And now all of a sudden we're feeling ashamed of not yet be mm-hmm. having arrived at the anti-diet fat liberation like side yes. of things too. So if you wouldn't mind sharing just some of your own experience and reflections on your transition, I think it would be helpful for people who are in some stage of their transition as well. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, because this has been um, a journey, a, a transition. A tra- you know, it, it's not something that has happened overnight. And so I'll just take you back a few years. Um, so back in 2013, I became a certified health and wellness coach. And I quit my full-time job in corporate America in late 2013 to pursue my own business of health and wellness. And initially, I did sell weight loss. But, you know, I was one of those people. Um, not that there's, well, I was one of those people who was sort of a ditch the diet girl. I even had a program called ditch the diet. And uh, the place that I was coming from at that point was that I was still selling weight loss. I was still telling people you can lose weight, but you don't have to do this restrictive traditional dieting. And so I did that for like a year and a half or two years And then over time, I just became exposed to different ways of thinking. And, you know, this is one of the great things about social media, specifically Facebook. Like, you know, it gets a bad rap because it it, just like anything that human beings get our hands on it, we can turn it into good or into we can destroy things with it. So uh, through Facebook and other social media platforms, I just encountered other ways of thinking and ultimately encountered the concepts of Um, health at every size and intuitive eating. And so, you know, that was a big shift for me because selling weight loss was a big part of my business. It was how, uh, you know, it was what I included in my sales copy. It was what I included in testimonials from former clients. It was a selling point. And so um, I think late, uh, early last year or the year before, I decided Yeah. Oh, I think it was in in 2015. I decided that I would not sell weight loss. And I wrote this big blog post about it because, again, it it was my writing that helped me come to this conclusion. It's something that I had thought about for a while. But honestly, Lou, like when I started writing it and it took me a while to write the post, you know, it finally came to me that I don't want to do this anymore. And here's why. And so that was sort of my initial transition into things like health at every size and intuitive eating. And then, so that was in September of 2015. And so um, all of 2016, I think, I might be getting these years (laughs) mixed up, but um, so that was a big deal to not sell weight loss anymore. And so, you know, I started to really step into and learn about social justice issues, racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, all of those things. And I was starting to see 
that diet culture and dieting wasn't just this like annoying thing that doesn't work. I was starting to see it for the way that it really dehumanizes us as individuals and as a collective. And I, I was also starting to recognize it as a form of body oppression because rooted in diet culture is the idea that bodies of a certain size and weight are not acceptable, not worthy, not deserving of respect and dignity and all of those things. And I wanted to be able to talk about dieting in a way that reflected the seriousness of it. And so I started to to do that. And then over time, I was just like, man, I don't really, I don't know what I'm going to do with my business. Like I didn't, I didn't want to be a health and wellness coach anymore. And so this year I decided that I would stop being a health and wellness coach. And of course, the way I always do things, I, I wrote about it. <laughs> and again, it was something that had been on my mind, but it wasn't until I started writing that it just came to me. Like, this is why I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just going to close the doors to my business. And so you know, I realized that the health and wellness community as I know it, and as I think most of us know it, is not really about health and wellness. It really is a way that we perpetuate a lot of injustices, and it's a way that we perpetuate diet culture. It's really just the diet industry with like some yoga poses and green juice. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it doesn't take into consideration that the health and wellness community at large, the leaders of the health and wellness community don't think about things that affect our health and wellness, like issues around social injustices that like, that's rarely if ever talked about by people who you think of when you think of health and wellness is mainly restricted or confined to exercise and what you eat, which is really no different than the diet industry and weight loss industry. So I decided that this is not for me. And I just wanted to stop calling myself a health and wellness coach. And right now I'm focusing more on my writing and speaking. So that's sort of been my evolution from 2013 till today, starting off as a ditch the diets, but not giving any context around the cultural impact of dieting. And then over time, just coming to this place where I am now, where I want to see something different in health and wellness. I want to see health and wellness be defined in a different way that includes all aspects of our lives and well-being and not just a, a fancier way of, of saying weight loss or dieting. So that's where I am right now. Oh, and I so appreciate it because what I hear you saying is you know, in one sense, if it walks like a diet and it talks like a diet, which is much of the wellness world, then totally. it really is a diet. And that's not helping the whole person. Holistic health, right? But when we think about the whole person, we should be thinking about where they're rubbing up against oppression, marginalization, uh, injustices, pain, grief, economic issues, or, or yes different abilities, all of these things, we should be thinking about all of that in the context of what that means to their emotions, to their lived experience, to their mental health, and also their physical health. And then on top of it, which again, this could probably be a two hour episode if you just left us to our own devices, because we can even <laughs> talk about health, right? And like, yes. why that's become this sort of social mandate that's moralized and you're only good if you're pursuing, quote unquote, good health, even though no one can seem to define that term. None of us can really define yep. that term. I don't think we could define wellness either. I think if you asked several different people, I know Virgie Tovar did this with the term health, but she put a bunch of college students, yes. grad students in a room and had them give her the definition of health. And no two were alike. And some people were bringing in things like body sizes or being free from disease and other people were taking more of a mental health or holistic approach. And the bottom line is none of us really know what these things are, but there's these industries that sell them to us as though they know, as, oh, yeah. as though they've got the magic secret, the special way in which that we can all become healthier or more well or thinner and then we go for it. So I hear you saying like, okay, I'm just done with that. <laughs> And if it doesn't take into account the whole person, I'm not interested in it at all. Yeah, because I'm not. Because, you know, you like you said in the beginning, you can't 
you're telling people what they should eat if they or they should eat this certain um, diet or these vegetables or this fruit when you are not acknowledging their access or lack of access to fresh foods or to a grocery store or their ability to to get out of the house like it's just so complicated we we treat it as if it's one size fits all like we're all having the same experience and we all want to have the same experience and none of that is true Right. I, and yeah. And again, and then it's like, as you were talking, I'm sitting here thinking, or we tell people, you know, drink so much water a day and make sure it's free from this contaminant and this. And then there's people in the United States in certain cities like Flint who haven't had clean water for years now. And yet we're still pushing this wellness bit, right? With, with, <laughs> yes. It's crazy to me because yes, then what in the world is wellness? I just don't even understand. But yeah we're talking about this transformation that you've had and the revelations you've had over time that have brought you to the place that you are now. And for the listeners, if they're on this journey, what is your encouragement or advice for them? Because again, I think sometimes we can feel like, oh my gosh, I thought this thing was it and it's not. So am I just going to get confused again? Or, you know, again, this the shame and the guilt of having believed something so strongly for one time. And then that season of transition can be really tough for people as they're learning what is this new truth? What are they really pursuing at this point? So I don't know if you have any advice for people who are on that same journey that you were on. Yes, I think one of the most important things is to know that there really is no place to arrive at. There is no destination. I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. Like, you know, there's still so much I have to learn about this. So I'm not at any arrived place where I can sit on high and just (laughs) speak to the masses because that's not true. I think it's a journey for all of us. We all start at different places. And like I said before, we're not all having the same experience, nor do we want to have the same experience moving forward. So I think like knowing, knowing that, but also knowing what is true for you or discovering what is true for you. I think one of the things that writing helps me to do is to challenge and question a lot of the things that have been told to me about me and about people who look like me and about the world in general that now just don't seem right and don't make sense. But still, there are things that I've held on to for decades. And so over time, just kind of peeling away and challenging and questioning those layers has become really important. And I think the the third thing is to be in community with people who are also going through this journey. You don't all have to be at the same place, but having voices around you that sort of um, reinforce this new truth can be really helpful. So that curiosity and questioning and then also the community are so important. And I love what you said. There is no, we're not going to arrive. If, if we're growing, if we're evolving, if we're changing due to our introspection and also looking out into the world and questioning and observing what's happening, then we're doing our thing, right? There is no end goal necessarily. The goal is to continue to be curious and to do that in community is something that's so valuable. Yes. Continue to be curious. I hear you now talking about community and something that really moved me was a quote from one of your writings uh, recently, well, relatively recently, that said, women's body image is a collective issue. Our society suffers when half the population channels their creative energy into being smaller. And again, I hear then that whole idea of our collective Mm-hmm. Our collective humanity is suffering at the hands of diet culture. I'd love for you to speak into that quote a little bit more because I found it so moving and powerful. I even shared it on Instagram. And oh, people, yes. and Thank people you. were like, oh, yeah. And people were like, oh, this is so great. You know, and I'm like, yeah, it, it hits something. It hits a nerve. Yeah, you know, oftentimes our struggle with body image can feel very lonely or individual. And sometimes that kind of transfers into when people go into the body positive space, you know, then all it becomes then all about me and how my body is not accepted and me, 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 which I get that. And I get that I, that we should be working on, um, or we can be working on seeing ourselves differently, 
But the reality is we live in a world with other humans and we are impacted and influenced by the things that go on around us. So community and our collective is really important. We're, we're an interdependent society. Like we work together. And so when you think about, if you just think about yourself or the women around you, friends, family, and the amount of time and energy that we spend collectively on trying to avoid being fat or gaining weight, it's, it's, I mean, if we, I would hate to quantify it because it's, it would be sad to see the number of life years that go into doing something that ultimately is, uh, goes against ourselves, right? It's going, it's uh, spending a lifetime or a significant part of our lives to go against ourselves when that time and energy and brain space and money can go into other more nourishing, nurturing, and life-giving endeavors. And so I I do think society suffers when we have such incredible power being harnessed in a way that is not productive for the individual or for for the collective. Yeah. So that's sort of what I was thinking when I wrote that. Absolutely. And I've talked about this before, too, in, in the sense that, and again, women aren't the only victims, people who identify as women are not the only victims yes. of diet culture. Uh, people who identify as male or yes. any place in the gender spectrum are still facing some of our ideals that happen often to be genderized, though, in, in the way that marketing yes. and media displays dieting, fitness, thinness, and the pursuit of the quote unquote, perfect body, there is very much of a gendered ideal, which is the white cis female thin ideal that is everywhere all the time and uh, curves in all the right places let's say and i say Mm. right in air quotes Uh, but but you know there is this ideal that is constantly marketed to us and then what happens is when again because this is marketed so often to women and i think isabel fox and duke has said the more rights women have gotten in history the harder it is to achieve the beauty ideal so here we are getting more rights to go do our thing and and work our magic and give our gifts and our talents and our wisdom to the world. But first, we must always look the part. We must always show up having dieted down and gotten smaller and taken up less space. And so you have all of these rights that we've been afforded. And yet, instead, like you said, we're channeling so much energy, so much time, so much brain power and space into how can I get smaller? How many calories did I eat today? Like, how can I be better, gain more approval? And yes. it's, like it's taking away, like you said, from the collective, because 50 percent ish of our energy and our love and our creativity and our intelligence is channeled into dieting. And channeled into Absolutely. the pockets then, let's get real, of, of industries that are really, I know you've shared this, and I think this is such a great term, but they are, they're making money off of our manufactured insecurities. Mm-hmm. I'd love for you to speak to the audience about that a little bit too, these manufactured insecurities. What are they? Yeah, you know, it's, it's the holding up of a standard that most of us cannot achieve and then selling us on the idea that if we just buy this thing, this app, this food, this plan, this workout DVD, that we can then meet that ideal. But the reality is we can't. And so you're then, ba- you're then m- made to feel less than if you don't meet up to this ideal. And so you feel like you have to constantly spend money to, to meet that ideal. And then you don't, and then you have to spend more money in a different place. It's just an ongoing cycle of getting money in the hopes of becoming something different. You know, the whole premise is to, is to become some other thing to become, to, to meet up to a standard. There's no money in encouraging people to be who they are and discover what that is. It's there's a lot of money in creating these manufactured problems like cellulite and muffin tops and saddlebags and all those awful names. There's money in that in in trying to get rid of those horrible things. So it's once you see that, I think one, that was sort of a wake up to me that it's it's the cycle of putting out constant money and energy 
to attain something and maintain something that is almost impossible for most of us. And I like what you shared earlier, too, about the idea of as an individual, that can be hard, right? There's real suffering involved and realizing that the culture is holding up the standard that we can't attain, that they're telling us we should attain, that we want to seek to attain. And that's where then I think, and I'd love to get into this with you too, but some of the body positive or most of the mainstream body positive community has sort of gotten confused because there's these public displays of the individual side, like you've shared, of that very personal side of body positivity, which is needed and necessary for us as individuals to work that self-acceptance, that body acceptance, to get rid and dismantle the diet culture in our own lives and places and spaces. But if we do it in a vacuum, we miss the fact that there's several, there's just several intersections of privilege that even those people who are showing (laughs) their belly rolls on Instagram or have fancy hashtags and huge followings based on them being quote unquote, brave enough to show themselves yes. in their underwear when they're just slightly off of the, the marketing and media yeah. body ideal misses a whole host of other people, whether we're talking about ageism or racism, or again, yeah. gender identity, or we're talking about physical abilities, mental abilities, mental health, like there's so many other mm-hmm. components collectively to body positivity that we miss. And yet the individual thing really is real because marketing really is trying to get you, the individual, to buy the stuff to make yourself better. So what do you think, like, how do we make this a helpful process? How do we, I mean, I don't even know if we can take mainstream body positivity back from what, where it originated as fat liberation and as something that had nothing to do with saying, hey, I'm pretty too. It was more about like, I don't owe anybody pretty. Like that was where it originated, right? Yes. Uh, but yeah. how do we how do we make the two meet? Is there a way to say, hey, this individual BOPO that we have going on, but the collective need for body liberation, is there a way to mesh the two together or have them work towards the collective good? There probably is. And this is something that I've been thinking about for a while too. I, you know, I don't know what that is. What What I can say is, that we can't get stuck at the individual level, right? We can't just say, okay, well, now I'm working on getting great with accepting myself and my body and there, I'm done, right? I think there's a lot of work to be done for the collective. And mainstream anything just gets watered down. And what we're trying to accomplish is very radical. So the the revolutionariness and <laughs> radicalness of fat liberation and fat positivity and fat acceptance has sort of, I mean, not sort of, it has been, in a lot of cases, it has been completely diluted and turned into mainstream body positivity. Because you'll see the types of people who are primarily centered are, like you said, just a little bit off of the ideal. And if they're even, if they're more off the ideal, they have, they are curvy, quote unquote, or they're fat in the right places. They're usually young, white, able-bodied women, conventionally attractive. Like we just are perpetuating the same thing. So, you know, the, the day you see a fat, black, lesbian <laughs> woman in a wheelchair being featured then like when you see that yeah when that when that's airy real <laughs> yes when when that's <laughs> when we start to see that on a regular basis then we're making some progress right like when we center the most marginalized that leaves room for everyone else but if we keep elevating the same people with slight differences then we're not really making a lot of progress and i think when the mainstream gets a hold of anything unfortunately it runs the risk of having this happen which you know we would like for this to get into the mainstream so i don't know how you reconcile those two things we need to get into the mainstream but when things get into the mainstream they get screwy so agreed and i don't know how you reconcile it either because to be honest i'm someone again who's in this industry of body image coaching and helping people break up with their diets, not so that they get thin, right, but so that they give middle fingers to the diet industry that's capitalizing off of their insecurities. And I do this work, and yet I don't feature, I I struggle with showing up fully, because I try not to feature myself 
uh, my full mm. body because I am a, well, now blonde because I dyed my hair, but tall, thin, able-bodied white woman. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I don't need more of me everywhere. I just don't. But the other thing that makes me feel really uncomfortable, even though I don't show myself, I'm totally cool with my rolls and I'm totally cool with my cellulite on my legs and I'm totally cool with these things, but I don't show them because to me, I've always just had the sense that that it is a slap in the face to a collective that uh, struggles with marginalization and oppression on several levels that I could never even imagine experiencing. But what I also don't like, which I also don't think is the solution, and this is horrible, right? We're not supposed to talk about the things that aren't working. (laughs) We're supposed to have (laughs) these good ideas. But for me, the thing I don't think is working either is when we go, okay, I'm this straight, thin, white, blonde woman. So I'm just going to go take this picture over here of this person who is like a fat black femme and I'm going to go take this picture over here from this person who's in a wheelchair and I'm going to post those on my social media look now I'm totally body liberation and there's still something missing in that for me because I think that we can appropriate people's Uh, struggles and people's existence here. We can take away from what they're truly experiencing to just kind of be like, oh, it's now trendy to not just do Bopo for myself, but to make sure I'm including other races and abilities and ages. Yes. Oh, goodness. Yes. But I don't know then. How do we do this? Yeah. So, you know, I've thought about this too. So, (laughs) so it has become trendy to do that a lot. And so you see people following that trend. Because you, people get criticized for just just featuring like on their social media or sales copy for just featuring um, young, white, conventionally attractive, you know, the standard. Right. So then they say, OK, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to continue to perpetuate that. So I'm going to take some pictures of um, diverse images of people of color, of um, disabled people, all co- people across all the gender spectrum. But what I find sometimes is missing, though, is the actual work. So that seems like a very surfacey thing to do, because you can go to any stock photo, not any, but you can go to, there are quite a few diverse stock photo companies out there where you can get these pictures and post them on Instagram and on your sales page. But that's not where it ends, right? It's respecting and honoring and acknowledging the humanity of all people It's amplifying their voices. So not just putting their image on what you say, it is amplifying their voices as well. So, you know, I think the the big thing is to acknowledge that that's not the work, just putting up pictures of different people of different sizes and races and genders. That's, that's not the work. I think that's just like a little, that's a very small part of the actual work. And sometimes people mistake that for the work and think, hey, well, I got all these pictures up and I'm using all of the right social justice buzzwords, but I'm not doing the work. Yeah. And, and I think you're exactly right. And you can tell. Yes. I definitely can tell those people, those practitioners and those social media personalities mm-hmm. who are doing the work. And this is a part of displaying yes. that or getting it out to the greater public. But they're actually doing the stuff all the time out in the world, not just at their phone or their computer. You can definitely tell, I think, the difference. So it's not to say it's across the board something that shouldn't be happening, but there should be the more happening. It should be the least yes. of the things happening. Yes, absolutely. Agree. Yeah, it's the work. It's the engaging in dialogue. It's the educating yourself. It is the not having to be perfect or right or have the last word or, ha- you know, it's, it's really involved and it's ongoing and it's not something that you can just do and change overnight or even in a week or a month. It's a lifelong thing. Yeah. And it's definitely too going, looking at the collective, which is something that's coming up in our conversation over and over again. It's like stepping outside of me and my little social media feed or my personal experience with my legs or my stomach and going, okay, this is something, but this is here because of this greater issue. And actually somebody who is truly intentionally wanting to change the experience of the collective isn't going to just hijack photos or, you know, (laughs) do stuff for show, right? They're like actually out there 
making the change. And for all the listeners, I mean, that's where the action is in the collective. As individuals, yes, we have we have our personal work to do. There's those struggles that we experience, but we experience them because collectively we've been taught. And this is something yes. Melissa writes about so much that I will be sending you guys to those specific blog posts for sure in the show notes. But this is something we've been taught to care about. Melissa, I know you've said like women didn't come out like wanting to be skinny and white and blonde and taking up less space, we've been taught to do these things. Yeah. We, I mean, we see how beneficial that is. We see that that is, you know, the thin, white, young, conventionally attractive. It's the definition of femininity. We see how that's cherished and respected. And and so why wouldn't one want to pursue that? Right. It just, it's hard to to get that thought out of your mind that this is the ideal and this is what you should aspire to, but it completely ignores who you are as a human being. And that, and, and I still haven't really been able to articulate that idea the way that I want to, but that to me is sort of the crux of the whole thing that there's, you know, as a black woman who is not tall or thin or any of those things to be taught that And to have that teaching reinforced (laughs) all the time, to be taught that the way you are is not right. I mean, it's such a harmful thing to walk around with. And to have people reinforce that to you all the time, your entire life, that something is inherently wrong with your body, your hair, your skin, your nose, your lips... It is one of it's a very dehumanizing thing to to be made to believe that you some you are just so wrong that you have to spend your entire life chasing something else that ultimately you will never be able to get anyway. So it's just it's a soul destroying thing. It really is. And I'm glad that you're bringing this up because I wanted to ask you one more question before we moved on to our closing questions. And that was about the intersection of racism and diet culture. I'd love for you, you did just start sharing about it. Hey, like being told as a black woman that my hair, my nose, my stature, you know, whatever, all of these things are just wrong, that I'm wrong, is what you were just talking about. And uh, But I'm curious if there's anything else you'd want to say or share with the listeners about the intersections of racism and diet culture because they're there. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm still learning that myself. I still have a lot of things to read, but I've learned over the past year that as obvious as it is or as it was, it still seemed like a surprise and a revelation when I just sort of discovered for myself that, you know, the ideal is the ideal woman is thin, young, white, conventionally attractive. But it made me realize that everything that we view, at least here in North America and the United States, is through the lens of whiteness, meaning white as human, as American, as normal, and everything else is other. And so that revelation is what kind of got me on this path. And and I notice it now in um, diet culture and, and how we, you know, fat phobia gets layered on racism and just how, how <laughs> fat women of color are treated and seen versus um, fat white women. And I've seen a lot of critiques of the fat movement, fat acceptance movement, um, where, you know, again, the people who make it to the mainstream are primarily young and white. You know, even people, even women and people in bigger bodies. And so, you know, I think that's just something to really pay close attention to. Again, we're not all having the same experience. And we're not all, we don't all want to have the same experience either. So I think that's really, that's something that's important. Even though a lot of us struggle with body image, there's still other issues that complicate that. And race is definitely one of them. Absolutely. And it's one of them. It's funny. It just came up recently. And I know you and I both had things to say about it. So I'm not going to be naming names, not because I want to protect anybody from scrutiny, but because I'd really prefer they get no more publicity than they need. But recently, a husband kind of like (laughs) patted himself, a white husband with a lifestyle brand of his own, like patted himself on the back for being attracted to his wife. (gasps) Shock. 
And for her being, I mean, he didn't come out and say this, but the way I read it was she was good enough. Good on him for settling for this woman who wasn't the conventional idea of beauty. And here it is again. We've talked about this already. She was just maybe a little further towards one of the ends of the spectrum, but she was pretty close to center. On that bell curve, she was still close to the highest part. Yes. And he like patted himself on the back and it went viral and they were on all these talk shows and and radio shows talking about how cool and feminist he was to like love this white, (laughs) conventionally beautiful uh, lifestyle blogging woman who also happened to have a racist past. (laughs) Yes. But this is the thing. Now we're going like, oh, oh, look, we've evolved as like the human race that he thinks that this is pretty. And thank goodness, you know. But it was crazy to me, and it brings up some of what you were saying, which is, again, we are just now at this place where people are celebrating white men who think that (laughs) young, white, beautiful women who are a little bit over the beauty ideal are attractive, let alone then we bring in these other areas, these other intersections. Yes. Where we need more inclusion, more diversity when it comes to these other intersections of race and age and ability are nowhere to be found. And this post is going viral because, gosh, he loves someone who might be 15 pounds over the BMI range. Yes, yes. I mean, I had seen that picture going around for a couple days and then I finally read the post and I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah, those are the stories that unfortunately make it to the mainstream media, the centering of whiteness and like a little bit off of the standard as something that is radical and revolutionary that a guy should receive any type of kudos for finding his wife attractive and then like being public with that desire or love for her. Like, what? I mean, just the whole thing was just so sickening. And thankfully, there were quite a few pieces of back, <laughs> backlash to that whole thing. But, you know, not enough. I think initially, what I try to do in my work is to is to help people become more savvy. So when they see stuff like that, they're like, what? This is no, this is not this is not acceptable. There's nothing special or radical or revolutionary or world changing about this next. That's what I, that's my goal is to be able to have people pick that stuff apart and not share it as if it's some earth shattering discovery. Yeah. And that's exactly why I brought it up because listeners, if you were listening to this and what Melissa was saying before I brought this specific story up was the idea of stopping to notice where there's these other issues at play, who's not being represented, what are we celebrating, and where are the privileges still in what we're celebrating, is such an important inspection or curiosity to do in these times where we feel like, oh, we're really evolving, or how bopo of me, or of this man, or whatever. And then when we look at it, it's really just, you know, a little a little spin. Yes. And being critical and having that critical eye and and taking a second, third, fourth look to go, who's not represented? Where is there still oppression, marginalization happening in this image or in this blog post or in this wellness world or whatever is such a powerful tool to continuing to not only free the collective, but yourself. And it's something, Melissa, I think that you do so well. Mm, Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having this conversation with me. I want to be conscious of your time. So I think we should move on to the closing questions now, if you're okay with that. Oh, yes, because we could go on for at least another hour and a half. Agreed, agreed. (laughs) Maybe season two, we'll have a round two. Okay, the first question I ask all of my guests, it's the namesake of this show. What does it mean to you, Melissa, to be an untamed woman? Mm, It means um, being what like being my true self and first discovering who that person is and just being her. Yeah. Unapologetically, I will say. Yes. Is there any circumstance, relationship or situation in your life where you'd like to be more untamed right now? (laughs) Um, I think in, in romantic relationships. Absolutely. Who is a woman that's inspired you in one way or another? I, right now, my big inspiration is Audre Lorde, who is, uh, was, she died in the 80s of breast cancer, 
a black feminist writer, poet, essayist, uh, who was um, amazing. If you read her stuff from the 70s and 80s, you think she wrote it last week. It's like really great stuff. And I've read um, a collection of her essays, Sister Outsider, yeah. probably four or five times. It's like a reference manual <laughs> for me. Audrey gets lots of love on this podcast. So yeah. for, <laughs> for any of the listeners who have yet to pick up one of her books or, you know, in any way come across her writings, what are you waiting for? Because whether it's me or my guests, we all seem to be quoting Audrey and bringing up just mm. what a powerful influence she's been in our lives. Do you have a favorite quote, motto or mantra? Yes. So when I write, uh, one of the things that I do in order to help my process, like if I get stuck, is just say what's true. And that helps me, oh my God, so much. And and I find myself using that in everyday interactions. Just say what's true. That's beautiful. What's one thing you want more of and one thing you want less of in your life? I'd love to have more leisure time, more time to write and take classes and lounge around <laughs> and go to the beach and all of, I would just love more leisure time and more time to be creative, which I think those two things go hand in hand. What I'd like less of. Oh, um, so I, unfortunately I spend a lot of time on social media, which I'm trying to cut back on. I would just like less of the conflict. There's just so much conflict between people about just ridiculous things. And, and I can feel that like it, it impacts the way I feel. So I'd like to have less social media because I probably, I can't control the conflict that people have with each other, but I'd like to just participate in social media a little less. Oh, for sure. I so agree with you. I'm right there where I'm like, I need you, but I don't need you social media. Like <laughs> I use you, but I don't want to. Yeah. It's like, it's so yes. hard. And that's exactly why, because I'm super sensitive. I'm, I mean, I'm vocal and opinionated too, which is like the yeah. double-edged sword. But then on the other side, I'm like really sensitive when people are only ever fighting and talking the negative. Mm -hmm. What do you do in your free time when you're not writing, when you are not speaking and teaching on body justice? Mm -hmm. I love to cook. Um, and I also love, I love to cook for myself and for friends and family. I just really spend time with my, I have two little nieces. Uh, one is uh, about to be seven and the other just turned two. And so I love, love, love just, you know, hanging with them and, and letting my inner kid come out with them. That's one of my favorite things to do now. A recent book, movie, TV show, or song that you're loving? Whew. So I watch Queen Sugar, yeah. which, yes, okay. So <laughs> I, I've only watched the first season. I still have to get into the second season. But, you know, the soundtrack to that show is amazing. And so the first episode um, of season one, I think it opened with a Michelle Indigay Ocello song called um, Faithful. And from the moment I heard that, like, it has had me, it, it had me at hello. And so it, I downloaded that whole, the whole album. And that's actually from 1999. I had no idea it was not a new song. Um, so that, that's what I'm loving right now. Michelle and Diggy Ocello from 1999. Awesome. Do you like chocolate? I love it. What's your favorite kind? So I like dark chocolate with salted caramel mm. inside. Good choice. Do you have any tattoos? I do. What's your favorite one? Well, I have one, I only have one, and it's a tattoo that I got after a breakup when I was 20. So it was, you know, <laughs> it's cherries, which I don't even like cherries. <laughs> <laughs> it was just something to do after a breakup when I was 20 years old in college. You know, do you look at it now and go, okay, hey, like this, in that season of life, this was a way to love and support myself. Yes. Yes. This was me exerting my autonomy. Yes, that's exactly what that is. And the good thing is it's by my ankle, so I don't really see it all the time. But yes, that's exactly what it was back then. Awesome. Do you have a person, a best friend, a confidant, someone that you just trust with all of you? Yes. So I have a younger sister. We're like a couple years apart, and she's my confidant. Absolutely. Perfect. So that's it for the closing questions. Now we can go into the one word on words, which I shared with you a little bit about before we started recording. But essentially, I'll give you a word and you just tell me and the listeners the first thing that comes to mind. 
It can be anything. You don't have to keep your answer to one word, but just whatever is the first thing that pops into your head. Mm -hmm. So the first word is unexpected. Mm. Surprised. Unseen. Sad and lonely. Uncool. <laughs> oh, me sometimes. Oh, that's what I had Desiree Attaway on the show, and she said that too. I'm like, you're you're cool. <laughs> Unappetizing. Oh, eggs and grits and oatmeal. Did you have a lot of that at some point in your life? Usually, I find the things that I think are unappetizing are things I had so often. Yeah, when I was younger, when we were kids, I hate those things. <laughs> Unwritten. Mm, my book, my words, the things I want to say, the things I need to say. Unwind. Beachfront house. <laughs> Beachfront house with um, a chef and some good books. Ooh, yeah. Unbroken. Mm, um, wow. Whew, unbroken. Human. And yeah, human was the first word that came to my mind. Untrue. Don't write it, don't say it. Unselfish. Giving. Undeniable. My worthiness. Yeah, awesome. So that was it. You did it. You did the one word on word. <laughs> I love one word on word. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you, Melissa, so much for being a guest on the Untamed podcast and talking with us today about body image, mainstream body positivity, diet culture, and uh, how we can actually work towards a collective good in these areas. Mm, thank you for having me. This was awesome. If you wouldn't mind letting the listeners know where they can find you, where they can read your writings and stay in touch. Oh, yes. So I'm at melissatoller.com and I have a truth telling tab. That's where all my blog posts are. I'm also on social media on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, my handle is Melissa D. Toller. And I'm also on Facebook as Melissa Toller. Perfect. Thank you. And for the Untamed listeners, as always, links to the things that we've talked about in this show and ways that you can stay in touch with Melissa will be at the show notes at untamedpodcast.com as well as anywhere else you're listening, iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere else you can get a hold of the Untamed podcast. So thank you so much, Melissa, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thank you for listening to the Untamed podcast and guest Melissa Toller. If you're interested in more information on Melissa and her body justice work, or if you'd like to see links to things talked about in this episode, you can find them all at untamedpodcast.com. I'd love to hear feedback from you on today's show, so email, message, or social media comment me with your questions and thoughts, and if you want to be the first to know when future episodes are launched or receive podcast-related emails, then be sure to sign up for the podcast newsletter via the link at untamedpodcast.com. Finally, if you like the show and want to spread the word, I'd be happy if you shared it, rated it, or reviewed it. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, I'm your host, Lou Urich, wishing you a wild week.